Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our second present, a second webinar out of four on heat pump month. And uh, today we have a, a really exciting lineup for you, and it's going to be some fantastic presentations over this hour and a half. Um, so for, my name is Jared Leake, and I'm the CEO of A2EP, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. I'd also like to start this webinar by acknowledging the traditional, only, uh, traditional custodians of where I am living and broadcasting from in the northern suburbs of Sydney, uh, that being the Garamurrigal people. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, if you'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which you reside, feel free to do so in the chat. And for those of you that are new to A2EP, we are a non-for-profit organisation uh, funded by members, and these are our members here, and these are our members that share our mission to double Australia's energy productivity. Uh, in short, we help businesses pursue a cleaner and more successful future by producing more with less. Uh, we explore the world's the world for best practice uh, we connect stakeholders and members and we advocate for programs and policy to help increase energy productivity and jobs all towards a zero emissions future in this uh, webinar format uh, for the web uh, uh, that we have here today uh, please put your questions in the q a box uh, and we'll try to get to those after each speaker if we don't we'll have the speaker just type away some some uh, responses for you after they've done their present uh, presentation um, each of the presentations uh, will be recorded uh, and, and the presentations with the recordings will be sent out next week. Um, so yeah, once again, please feel free to put those questions in the Q&A box or if you want to have a side chat, go for it. Uh, get, get into the, uh, into the chat there as well. Uh, the more interactive, surely the better. So uh, let's uh, get a bit of context for today's uh, meeting and today's, today's webinar, sorry. Um, the uh, federal government's low emissions technology statement came out last week. And with that, we, we were very happy to see heat pumps uh, uh, specifically mentioned as an emerging technology. And uh, we, we are fairly confident that uh, with, uh, with that acknowledgement and with the work that we're doing with the Energy Efficiency Council to, to show the federal government of the potential of, of heat pumps, uh, that we'll see more and more focus on the technology from the government and more and more support. Uh, added to that, we have the low cost uh, target for solar and uh, heading towards $15 per megawatt hour. Uh, for our European guests there, that's about 10 euros per, per megawatt hour. Uh, so, so we're certainly seeing the, the uh, advent of extremely cheap electricity. And as we'll get into in, the, in, in one of our presentations, uh, that really does lead to improving the business case for heat pumps. Um, certainly just to electricity and energy saving shouldn't be the only thing we think about with a heat pump. We really need to consider that, that, that uh, it offers a decarbonisation option to help you get off gas. It can help you save water by reducing the load on the, on the cooling towers uh, from your refrigeration plant. Um, it, it can uh, create a new cooling source for you if you wanted to start cooling your production hall. Um, and, and of course, importantly, it can help you increase production. Um, so yeah, so that ratio and that electricity price, not everything, uh, but certainly is important. We'll get into that uh, a little bit uh, later. Um, in terms of how all this is significant within Australia, um, so this is a quick breakdown of the energy consumption within Australia, and you'll see that 40-40% is used by industry, of that 52% is, is fuel for heating, and the majority of course is done by natural gas and coal. If you take that, uh, that amount of heating and you look at uh, how that's done by, by temperature, produced, not temperature required, um, you'll see there is a very big portion above 800 degrees and above 250 even. And, and certainly that, uh, that's a, no doubt of the domain of going to be for biomass and, and hydrogen in, in a decarbonized future. But below 250 degrees, um, from the, the further work that we've done and built on this, this lovely ARENA ITP report, um, showing that there is a very large amount of that uh, below 250 degrees, which is required for steam. And, and there's some 350 petajoules or so there of energy required by industry, mainly for steam, for cooking and for drying. And 
if we, if we looked at heat pumps, uh, say, 12 months ago, 18 months ago, you'd say, well, you know, that's not within the realm of, of heat pumps to do up to, say, 150, 160 degrees. Well, a lot's happened in the last 12 and 18 months, and uh, we're going to show you today the latest uh, developments and, and how this is really opening up this space of, of that uh, temperature demand around 150 to 160 degrees. Also showed this uh, slide last week showing that levelized cost of heating and, and certainly it's a case of where I've got the arrows there, um, the, the cost, levelized cost of heating for, um, uh, for heat pumps is certainly coming down as that electricity price comes down. You see when this modeling was done about two years ago, it was considered oh, it was quite cheap if we put in 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And, and, but if you look at the forecast, then from what the government is looking is heading towards a wholesale price of, of, of 1.5 cents per kilowatt hour, um, you can see how this is only going to get you know, better and improve the case uh, in terms of energy savings for heat pumps. Um, so certainly uh, that, um, that, that forecast price on its way down and really changing things. So with that, I would like to then launch into our first uh, presentations. Um, we, today we do have uh, Dr. Corden Apagus from the, uh, he's a senior researcher from OST in Switzerland. We've also got Dr. Veronica Wilk from the Australian Institute of uh, Austria. Austrian, sorry, Veronica, I've, I've made you a, a honorary Australian there. Austrian Institute of Technology. And we'll also have Oli Sipinen from uh, Howden calling in from Finland. All of our speakers have come in from Europe today and I'll, I'll give them the first of many thank yous for, for getting up early and joining us. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, our first speaker today is uh, Corden Apagus, and uh, Corden is a senior researcher at the East Switzerland University of Applied Sciences, Science of or OST. Uh, we had Corden present to us uh, last year and gave us a, a wonderful overview of uh, high temperature heat pumps and, and what was the latest in technology and what have you there. Uh, Corden, I'll admit your presentation I have used many, many times and referenced and what have you. It's been a fantastic resource for us over the last 12 months with the different modeling and understanding the technologies and, and, and advising others. Um, so it is, it is our absolute pleasure to, to welcome you back, Corden. I'll get you to uh, share your screen and, uh, and uh, I'll get, ask you to start your presentation there. Look, we, we have a bit of a technical problem there. Maybe um, uh, we'll jump over and see if we can get fix up Corden in the background there. Um, why, don't we, why don't we jump to uh, Veronica? Veronica, do you mind if we jump ahead and see if we can get to fix up Corden in the background while we, uh, we go through your presentation? Sure, sure, we can do that. Very good, thank you. Um, okay. And Veronica, if I just give you a quick introduction, if that's okay. Um, this is uh, the second time you've joined us, uh, joined us this year. Uh, so welcome back again. Uh, you, you gave us an update earlier this year about uh, what was happening with your project on, on uh, the dry F and, and, the, and the drying process that that's been using. Uh, so it's great to have you back. And, and for those that are new to uh, seeing Veronica, uh, she's the uh, Senior Research Engineer and uh, Thematic Coordinator at the Centre of Energy at AIT. Now, she leads the research field in efficiency in industrial process and system and works in the national and international research projects on industrial energy efficiency and integration of peak pumps. Um, so also the coordinator of the H2020 project for efficiency. Um, that's the, the demonstration project that we're going to hear about today. Uh, Thanks for getting up early, Veronica, and uh, over to you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here again in this webinar, and uh, I will tell you what has happened in the efficiency project since I was here the last time, so you can hear now also the um, continuation and the end of um, our story. Today, I have brought some insights into the operation of the high temperature heat pumps for drying, and I will jump right in. Um, does it work for you? Do you see my slides changing? Yes, that is. Thanks, Veronica. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so this is an overview on the dry efficiency project. Our main aim um, in this project was um, to realize heat pump installations that are able to deliver heat with temperatures up to 160 degrees C. And uh, we did work on two different heat pump technologies. Um, one, the closed-loop heat pump, 
with two demonstrations in Austria. Uh, one is used for brick drying, that's the red container that you can see on the left. And, and one is used for starch drying um, at the plant of Fakana, close to Vienna. That's the, the gray container in the middle. And the second technology that we were working on in the dry efficiency project was an open loop heat pump, um, a mechanical vapor recompression system that is used for bio sludge drying. And this is, this is implemented in a waste treatment process in Drammen in Norway. That's the research work of our partner Sintef, um, a research institute based in Norway. And today I will focus on the work of AIT and we were responsible for the closed loop heat pump development. Uh, this is a sketch of the closed loop heat pump. We're using uh, warm heat sources, uh, waste heat from the industrial process um, to supply heat up to 160 degrees C. In our demonstrators, uh, we use two different kinds of compressors. For the demonstrator in the brick drying process, we had piston compressors that were developed by Viking Heat Engines. This company is called, uh, called now Heat and AS. And we also had uh, two spool compressors that were developed by Pizza that are used in the Agrana demonstrator. We used a synthetic refrigerant, uh, Optan MZ by Kim Moores. Um, so the, the refrigerant name is R1336MZZZ. And during the project, our partner Fuchs developed a lubricant that is sufficiently viscous at the high temperatures that we're using it. And it's also compatible and thermal and chemical stable together with the refrigerant. This is how the starch drying process looks like. It's a flow stream uh, dryer that uh, requires hot air at temperatures around 160 degrees C. Um, at Agrana, they use uh, two heat exchangers to heat up the air. One is uh, providing heat from a heat recovery cycle. I will switch on that laser pointer. Um, so this is the first uh, heat exchanger using heat from the heat recovery cycle. And then there is a second heat exchanger that is providing heat with steam. We have integrated our heat pump right in the middle between those two heat exchangers, and we also use that heat recovery cycle as the heat source. We have here a temperature of 70 degrees roundabout, and so this is a very nice um, heat source for a heat pump. We have not integrated our dry efficiency heat pump directly into the airstream, but we have this intermediate uh, water cycle here. We need that for measurement purposes mainly, um, to be able to have an accurate measurement of the heat supply temperature and the capacity that is provided by the heat pump. The heat pump has a heating capacity of about uh, 400 kilowatt. This is 10% of the energy that is needed for the dryer. So this is a, a good size for a demonstration plant. And this is how the brick drying process looks like. Um, we have here a tunnel dryer um, that is heated uh, with a thermally driven heat pump. That heat pump uses hot air that is coming from the kiln as the thermal drive. It recovers uh, heat from the exhaust air, from the dryer, and it provides hot water with 90 degrees C. And uh, we use that water cycle with the dry efficiency heat pump, and we have a very similar uh, type of integration. So we have this intermediate circuit, and then uh, we heat air, and that air is used in the last uh, drying zone where higher temperatures are required to make the drying process more efficient. So these are the two installations um, that were realized. And um, this is how operation of this uh, demonstrator looks like. This is a time series from the Agrana installation. Um, a week of operation in March this year. And in the lower part of the diagram, we have the heat, um, the heat source temperature. Um, in red is the temperature um, coming to the heat pump. And the blue line indicates the temperature um, um, reduction when uh, with the heat pump. We see that the heat source is uh, ranging between 60 and 70 degrees C and we see quite a lot of fluctuations there. In the upper part of the diagram we have here the heat supply side. So this is the inlet temperature and at that time the heat pump was operated at 135 degrees C. And uh, we see here in a very nice way that the process control of the heat pump works, uh, works fine. So it levels out the fluctuation that are coming from the, um, from the heat source. So this is another week of operation. In um, June this year, we see again uh, fluctuations in the temperature of the heat source. And in this uh, time series, we also see that we have changed the condition of operation of the heat pump. So we have tested different temperatures. So this is operation at higher temperatures. It's 150, 155, what we have tested here. And uh, 
So um, these results were also very satisfactory, um, well-functioning um, of the process control and also high heat supply temperatures. Uh, this is a similar illustration for the Wienerberger demonstrator. Um, here we see a longer period. Um, this was in December 2019, um, January 2020. Uh, it's three weeks of operation. So if we compare that to the, the previous figures, we have here a much warmer heat source. Um, here, 88 uh, degrees were provided. And um, during those three weeks, the heat pump was operated at a heat supply temperature of 120. And um, an interesting observation are, are these peaks that occur at the beginning of the week. So they are coming from the brick grind process. And uh, we see the answer of the process control levels out these, um, these episodes. And uh, this is um, an insight into operation of high temperature. So this is from um, June, also last year, when we, um, when we had a long period of operation at 160 degrees C. And uh, yeah, here we also see some fluctuations in, in the heat source, but uh, stationary behavior of the heat pump. Um, this is an overview on the whole operation period. Uh, we have operated the demonstrators uh, both for about 4,000 hours until um, the end of August. So that's um, officially the end of the proficiency project. And uh, during that time, we have tested uh, many different operation conditions and uh, the histograms illustrate the range of heat supply temperatures. So for Wiener Berger, we had um, two peaks, one around 120, another one around 140. And here, the high temperature application close to 160 and 160. Um, at the Ghana installation, we've tested many different heat supply temperatures between 100 and 160. We have um, two, um, two peaks here also, uh, lots of operation around 135 and 150, 155. And um, this is how it turns out in terms of um, COP. Um, so the COP is uh, mostly the, uh, typically the most interesting uh, value to characterize heat pump operation. So the COP is the ratio of the, um, the heat that is provided by the heat pump um, divided by the amount of electricity that is consumed. And in those two, two diagrams, the COP is presented over the temperature lift. And that's the temperature difference between the heat source, uh, the heat sink and the heat source. So this is basically a measure for um, the amount of work that is provided by the compressor. On the left, we have um, values for the Grana demonstrator, and on the right, um, values for the, uh, for the Wienerberg installation. And you also see a color code um, that uh, represents the heat supply temperature, starting with dark blue. Those are the low temperatures, um, ranging over green to orange to red uh, for the high temperatures. Um, so we have operated, um, we have here summarized um, 8,000 hours of operation in, in these two diagrams. And uh, we have done this by um, representing a stationary operation that lasts for at least 10 hours by a single data point. So um, all these different conditions are summarized in, in different um, um, data points that represent this uh, type of stationary operation. And stationary operation is characterized by the same in and outlet conditions of the heat pump and the same settings on the compressor. You also see um, uh, arrow bars, so the most more prominent to see here um, for the Wienerberg installation. This is the variation that you find in the data uh, when summarizing um, it as a single data point. So this is a very good way to, to get an overview on the whole operation. For orientation, I've also included the gray line. This is an ideal heat pump that has a second law efficiency of 50% and the heat, uh, heat supply temperature of 120. So here you see the most basic um, uh, relation. Um, at the low temperature lift, we have a high COP, and at a high temperature lift, um, the COP decreases. And this is also true for the efficiency heat pumps. Um, I will just pick out um, some interesting areas in the diagrams, starting with the, the Wienerberger plant. So at a temperature lift around 40 degrees, uh, we have a COP of um, 4.7. And uh, here the, the blue ones are for a heat supply temperature of 120. Um, and if we go to the highest temperatures, that one represents 160 degrees C, and there we have a COP of uh, 
uh, with the Agrana demonstrator, we have tested um, uh, a big uh, range of operation conditions. Um, compared to the Wienerberger installation, we have operated um, this one at higher temperature lifts. This is mainly due to the colder heat source that we had available. And um, at a temperature of 138, which also corresponds to very close to the design point of, um, of the, the heat pump, we have a COP of 3.2, and that's that one. That's a, that's a very, very good um, operation point. Uh, we have tested several uh, different conditions for the, the high, on the high temperature side. Those are the orange and red ones, but also lower lifts where we have um, similar as we've seen the one before at a temperature lift of um, 40K, we have um, a COP of about um, 4.2. So um, this is a very satisfactory result of the operation of those um, pilot plants. And um, um, here I have borrowed some data from Corden um, from his uh, market overview that was published in 2018. Um, you see here the gray dots um, included um, in addition to the dry efficiency data. And um, it's very good to see that um, our our heat pump uh, demonstrators match very well with um, heat pumps that are already available on the market that are operating in the same range of temperature lifts. So this is a very, very nice result. And uh, it's good, good to see that in, in, in this way. Um, and now I want, to, uh, I want to take the operation results from the dry efficiency um, demonstrators um, to, to speak about the potential of um, drying in general and how to use heat pumps for drying. So as I've said, we have um, very warm heat sources in both our dem uh, demonstration installations. So it's uh, no, uh, they are both external heat sources, not directly related um, or yeah, somehow related to the dryer. Uh, for the Wienerberger installation, it's the absorption heat pump and uh, at the Grana installation, it's that waste heat, recovery waste heat recovery cycle that collects waste heat from other processes that are available. If those heat sources are not available, still a drying process is a very interesting application for a heat pump and it has um, an interesting heat source in itself and this is uh, the human exhaust gas. There we have um, all the water that is evaporated from the product that is dried within the process and uh, we can also make use of the condensation energy that is available there. But this comes at a price because then we will lower the heat source outlet temperature of the heat pump so we have seen that in the time series for the efficiency heat pump, we had here values around 60 to 80 K, um, uh, 80 degrees C, and um, that will be lowered to round about 40 degrees C when we use um, condensation and um, the energy that is present in the humid exhaust gas. And this is just an extrapolation. So if we follow the line of, I will go back here. So if we follow that line, just for orientation, if we go to a higher temperature lift of 120, we end up with a COP that's around about 1.8. And this will be um, the lower end of, of the comparison that I will, will show you. The 4.7, COP of 4.7, that was um, one of the, the higher values that we have measured with the efficiency heat pumps at lower temperature lifts. And uh, for a sound comparison, we will compare the heat pump to a natural gas burner that delivers the same amount of heat. Um, I have put here Austrian values, um, and I will I will explain that a bit because uh, they might uh, so they, they might be different in other parts of the world. Um, starting with the CO two emissions, so in Austria we have um, rather green electricity. Uh, when you use uh, one kilowatt hour of electricity, uh, you emit uh, two hundred fifty eight grams of CO two. That's already uh, there are already less emissions from the use of electricity compared to natural gas with an average value of 271. And the European average is quite close to the emission of, of natural gas. Uh, for, the, for, the econ, uh, for the economics, I have also used average values from the Austrian industry uh, last year. So a gas price of uh, 4 cents per kilowatt hour and an electricity price of um, about 10 cents per kilowatt hour. So the electricity costs more than and doubled in um, natural gas. And uh, for the future, um, I've also included a natural um, SU2 price, um, starting with 55 euros per ton. This was um, the average price that uh, carbon emissions had in, on the European market. And um, I also had a look at increased CO2 prices of 110 euros per ton. This is the CO2 price that they currently have in Sweden. So 
this is uh, this is not not an invention, but it's uh, it's already used in, in other parts um, of Europe. And um, uh, in Austria, we have ambitious goals for 2030. Um, so we want to have all our electricity to be supplied from renewable energy carriers, and by then the consumption, uh, the use of one uh, kilowatt hour of electricity will lead to um, 16 grams of CO2 emissions. So this is a very low value. Um, the European average is expected to be a bit higher, but also um, considerably less than we have it today. So if we put in um, all these values, we, uh, we come to this result in terms of um, end energy and CO2 emissions. Um, so to read how to read this diagram, we have here at the lower end, this uh, is the result for a COP of 1.8 for the high lift application. And this is the result for the COP of 4.7 for the low lift application. And uh, we see here that we can achieve end energy savings ranging from 50 to more than 80 percent uh, with a heat pump if it replaces a natural gas burner. And this is a very interesting potential. In terms of emission, the, uh, uh, the result is quite similar. If we start from, um, from the bottom, this is the current situation in Austria. Um, if we save end energy, we also save CO2 emissions as the electricity is um, already rather green. Um, up to 84% uh, of CO2 emission reductions are possible here. And um, the situation is similar when we use the European average, this is presented here. But if we um, apply uh, the renewable electricity that we should have uh, by 2030 in Austria, we, will, uh, we can almost completely decarbonize the process when using a heat pump, coming to CO2 emission reductions of close to 99%. And it's also good to see that the influence of the COP really decreases when we use uh, green electricity. Um, so this is an interesting, a heat pump is a, is a very interesting measure to, to decarbonize industrial processes, especially drying processes. Um, another important part of the discussion is of course um, uh, the economics. And uh, again, starting from the bottom, this is Austria today. Um, if we take those average um, industrial prices, we have to make sure um, today that the heat pump does not uh, require temperature lift that is higher than 85 um, K because then we will pay more for the operation of the heat pump than a natural gas pump. Um, if we would include today's CO2 price in this consideration, we will end up with a situation where all uh, where the whole operation range is already economically feasible, um, allowing for energy cost reductions in the range of 20 to more than 60%. And if we take um, Green electricity by 2030 and the high CO2 price that we currently have in Sweden, we will get to very decent energy cost reductions for the future. Um, on the right, you see a map of Europe. Uh, this is an illustration of the electricity to gas price ratio, which is for the economics of the heat pumps today, a very important value. Um, so the color code ranges from yellow. These are very heat pump friendly countries. Um, you see that. Uh, in the, the northern part of Europe with um, Finland and, uh, and Norway, here electricity and, and uh, natural gas is priced um, on an equal level. And when we move to the dark colors, we come to the countries where electricity is uh, comparably expensive, for example, Germany. And Austria is here quite in the middle, so it's here illustrated in orange that corresponds to a ratio of about 2.2, 2.5, depending also on the quantities of um, energy that are consumed. So also in terms of economics, this is a very positive outlook. And I also hope that for the future we will compare uh, heat pumps not only to natural gas, which is um, the current technology, but also to other renewable energy um, carriers that are used to supply process heat. Um, yeah, and this is a brief summary of what I've shown you today. Um, in the Trifficiency project, we were very successful in um, developing and demonstrating high temperature heat pumps. Our partners uh, were had developed um, compressors, lubricant, refrigerant um, that are well suited for high temperature application. We have now collected more than 8,000 hours in total for both demonstrators and have shown that um, the demonstrators work um, in, a stationary, um, in a stationary way with very satisfying performance. That is in good comparison also to other heat pumps. Um, heat pumps are also a future-proof way to supply process heat because it's the only technology that allows for waste heat recycling and upgrading and with that uh, contributes a lot to CO2 emission reduction. 
And of course, this cannot be only used for drying processes. There are many other processes that can uh, use a heat pump whenever you need to process heat up to 160 um, heat supply temperature, not the temperature that is currently provided to the process, but that's actually needed. Um, uh, then uh, you can also use a heat pump there. And uh, some examples where to, um, where to find these potentials, it's of course the food industry, paper industry, and also the chemical industry. And finally, I want to introduce you to the um, proficiency team at EIT. Um, for such a project, it's, uh, it's mandatory to have a dedicated and enthusiastic team to realize this work. And with that, um, I want to thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Veronica, thank you so much for the presentation and congratulations on the great results. Uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, blood, sweat and tears went into uh, getting this uh, operational. It seemed to follow a fairly good timeline as well. Of, we've been watching this for the last year or so and it seems like you've been hitting each of the, the time, the, the committed timelines. So, so well done there. Um, it, the difficulty, if I may ask the first question, is the difficulty in the retrofitting because it was existing plants mm. and whatever. Um, is there any, any comment on the difficulty of the retrofitting and whether or not those plants are planning to do full scale retrofit with this technology? Um, yeah, so it was, it was not only retrofitting what we did, but we were actually, um, we had almost lab conditions in our industrial facilities because they really uh, they were really looking for a good spot where to operate the heat pump without interfering the process. So we haven't touched the, the drying process itself. It was just a very good way to demonstrate a high temperature heat pump with a heat consumer that can take the 160. Um, we have found we have found a very nice replication potential within our two demonstration partners, mm -hmm. and uh, we definitely uh, will uh, follow up on this in the future. Um, it's not only the full scale for the drying application that we've seen here, but also related concepts looking into other heat sources. And uh, that's also a very interesting feature that was not, um, that was not in, in, in the center of our project because we really wanted to demonstrate the high temperatures. But from a process integration perspective, it's uh, also important to, to take into account that the heat pump also provides cooling. So you can use the heat pump to, um, to take some pressure from the cooling equipment that's already there. Mm. And, and it's, um, it's a good way to start from an integration point for the heat pump. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I've got a question here from the audience uh, about the uh, funding model and uh, sort of how much did it cost uh, uh, to do the demonstrations and, and where was that source of funding? Was it purely from, a, from a, um, say, governments and, and initiatives or was it, say, co-funded? Did, did, did uh, Agrana um, and Winneberger have to put yeah. in money? Um, yeah, what was the funding model about? Um, so it was a Horizon, uh, Horizon 2020 project, um, so it was funded by the European Union. Mm -hmm. In total, uh, uh, the, the grant was about 6 million euros for um, all the free demonstrators. And uh, for our industrial partners and also for the demonstration partners, this, this did not cover um, all, their, all their expenses. So they had a funding ratio of 70%, so they really put in also their own money into the development. Oh, good, 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 good. Thank you. And uh, any comments on the reliability of the heat pumps during the trials? <laughs> uh, did you have a few surprises and yeah. a few operational issues? There? I, I was I was smiling when I when reading that yeah there were bugs and issues um, as you always have when you operate um, an industrial plant. Interest um, it was very interesting to to find out that we had those bugs and issues not really related to the high temperature application but to to uh, let's say normal equipment. So pressure sensors, water pumps, and, and those items. So we had um, um, we had a serious delay related to the Corona crisis because um, we just started heat pump operation at Dakana uh, when Corona started. So uh, we were, um, yeah, it was a quite uncertain situation. Uh, um, operation was also stopped for a while. Um, and then we, we started the, then again. And we also um, had, um, issues with long lead times when you need to replace some parts and then you have to wait for six weeks or even longer to get them. Um, so yeah, we, uh, uh, we were able to, to fix all, all, almost all these issues that we have, um, uh, that we, we had during the demonstration. Well done. And uh, uh, 
um, that's not included in the presentation, but I will tell you anyways. Uh, we recently also checked the refrigerant and lubricant quality after mm -hmm. those 4,000 hours of operation, and it's still looking uh, really nice. So this is also a positive result. Congratulations. Well done. Uh, Veronica, very much thank you for a, a really good overview of that technology. Uh, we can't wait to see something like that out here in, in Australia. Uh, there's lots of companies who have committed to decarbonise. There's lots of companies that are doing this in terms of brick making and starch out here in Australia as well. So uh, we'll, we'll be uh, looking forward to uh, seeing the technology expand. Um, there's a few more questions in the uh, chat there, in, in the Q&A box there, Veronica, if you would have a chance to, to type in some answers for there, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving now and uh, to Certainly. the presentations. Mm. But thank you once again for presenting. Um, let's yes. try again. Um, Dr. Corden Apagus has uh, changed his uh, uh, laptop. We've got a new laptop in order now. And uh, let's see how that's going. Corden, are you there? Yes, I'm there. I hope you can hear me. Absolutely loud and clear. Glad okay, it's great. Glad we're working now. Okay. Um, did you want to start sharing your, your screen and uh, we'll launch yes. into the, the presentation? As, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, Corden has presented for us last year and did a, did a fabulous uh, uh, presentation on, on high temperature heat pumps. And it's uh, and just speaking to Corden before today, it's, it's amazing to see how much has changed over the last 12 months. Uh, and uh, and uh, so I'll hand over to you, Corden, and take us through the, uh, the latest in R&D there. Okay, great, Jared. Um, so uh, you still hear me well? Just Sounds good now, yep. Perfect. Okay, then you can see the screen. Absolutely, got it. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I'm so sorry that I, I missed uh, the first minute, but I thank Veronica very much uh, to uh, jump in. So the line in Aus Australia, in Austria, sorry, <laughs> seems to be better than in my house. So I'd like to give you an update on research and market uh, on industrial heat pumps. So I, I speak about technologies, uh, give a research update. I go into steam generating heat pumps especially and look at different cycles and then also application examples and case studies. So first of all, um, what is industrial heat pump? Um, so it's a definition from Annex 48. We say it's 100 kilowatts and higher heating capacity for industrial processes, but also for heating and uh, for domestic uh, large residential buildings. Um, so the heat pump, it's simply, let's say we focus on, on vapor compression heat pumps. There are other families of heat pumps, but we look at electrical driven ones. So we have the compressor, a condenser, expansion valve, and an evaporator in a basic cycle, and a refrigerant working fluid which is uh, here at the low pressure and high pressure, releases the heat to processes here and takes up the heat uh, from at the lower temperature. An important parameter is the COP, so the, the useful heat divided by the electricity. Uh, in the industry, uh, so we have um, normally a primary energy consumption, gas, oil, coil and uh, biomass, uh, it produces uh, processes and then has waste heat and this waste heat is useful heat for the heat pump which is driven by electricity and it generates uh, temper higher temperature heat again. So it is uh, closing the cycle, the energy cycle. When we look at the temperature ranges, we can structure the heat pumps by the supply temperature and the source temperature and uh, here in this area, we are like in conventional industrial heat pumps up to 80 degrees, up to 100 degrees supply temperature. We can speak about high temperature heat pumps and higher, very high heat pumps. Uh, the market attractiveness is mainly driven by the price ratio of electricity to gas. So here we have the, 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 the European map again. Uh, uh, like before uh, with, the, with the colors and the Scandinavian countries have a, a favorable uh, price ratio and there are others which uh, have higher ratio where gas is very cheap. Um, the industrial heat pump uh, can be described by the COP 
In this way, so it's a function of the temperature lift from the heat source to the heat sink. Uh, so there's a, a fit formula, for example, here with, with 45% second law efficiency. So, so these are data points from industrial heat pumps. Um, so with these values. When we look at these values and look at um, the European countries and their gas and electricity prices, we can calculate the price ratios and we can also calculate the COP that would be uh, the operate, par parity of operation costs compared to a gas boiler. And so then in Sweden, uh, the this COP would be very low, so that it is uh, high, uh, in parity to the gas boiler. Or in UK, it's it's well, it's much higher, 5.5. If we use uh, this um, this formula here again from from the from before from this industrial heat pump data, we can calculate a temperature lift, which is like in parity of the OPEX. And so this is the graph uh, as a function of the electricity to gas price ratio. So if we are here in the lower range, then we have like Sweden or Finland, or, or here we have UK again. So here we can just uh, check what <coughs> would be a favorable um, heat uh, temperature lift. And for Austria, it was uh, maybe 80 uh, Kelvin. So it was, uh, it's, it's, it's all, almost, all, almost uh, correct, I think, uh, uh, realistic. European average is at around 60 uh, Kelvin lift, so that it is in cost parity to, to a gas boiler. Um, okay, market potential, you can also, um, estimate from the boilers uh, installed. And so this is just a map of the gas boilers and oil boilers, coal boilers in Europe. And you see the biggest markets, uh, Germany, Italy, Spain, uh, and the uh, UK. But there are challenges to wider spread of industrial heat pumps uh, into the market. Uh, low awareness, uh, lack of knowledge, and the challenge of factory built and tailor made designs of the heat pump, so economics of scale, the amortization periods, the economy, which is mainly depending on the price ratio. Then there are other heating technologies which are competing, like okay, fossil fueled technologies, but also the renewable ones, which are, for example, uh, biomass, solar thermal. Um, or electricity directly or and so on. Then there is a requirement typically for heat storage uh, in combination with the heat pump, which makes it also more challenging for in, in integration and uh, retrofit. Um, and also um, for higher temperature, there is a lack or a challenge to have components which are temperature um, resistant. Uh, to design the heat pump, like the compressors, the valves, uh, and so on, piping. And also the refrigerants need to be available, so um, uh, in high uh, quantities. This is a graph that we showed uh, also last time. Uh, it's the status of end of 2018. So just several heat pump products <coughs> um, as a function of the heat supply temperature and um, heating capacity. Here on the top, we have Kobelco, the Japanese, then Viking Heat Booster, then there are now heat called Heaton uh, and Oxner. Um, so I go, don't go into detail, but important uh, point is the, the refrigerants which are used. And so the R245FA, which is a hydrofluor um, carbon needs to be replaced in the in the future because it has uh, too high global warming potential. So there, there's activity in the, res in the research, uh, researching uh, uh, alternative fluids. Then there, there are the, new, the um, natural um, refrigerants like uh, CO2, ammonia and water and also hydrocarbons 
which are counted to natural fluids. When you go to the costs, we can make a specific uh, costs curve as a function of the heating capacity. And these are several um, data from in European heat pump suppliers. And when we put in the, the cost data from Oxner and Cobelco, so these are just indicative values, we are a little bit higher than uh, for, for the higher temperature heat pumps. But uh, it's just uh, uh, depending on the sales distribution channels. Um, then there are several large scale uh, heat pumps which have a capacity larger than one megawatt for district heating and industrial applications. So here you see the names or the brands. So Turboden, Italy, Man Energy, Switzerland, Mitsubishi uh, in uh, Germany or uh, Japan, Siemens, Oxner or Cobelco. So what you see here, the, the capacities and there are options to cascade the, the heat pumps, several in parallel as to, to increase the heating capacity also to the megawatt scale for Oxner, for example, or Cobelco. And the temperatures they can reach are here all above 100 degrees up to 174 in, in this case. Uh, Oxner has these two heat pump uh, products which are um, providing heat up to 130 degrees. So a cascade uh, system or a, a system with economizer with vapor injection. Um, the fluids they use or they can use are also now available in, in uh, uh, the alternative ones which have low, very low uh, global warming potential. And so here you have the, the operating maps uh, or let's say the scales uh, for them again. So they have tube bundle heat exchangers and screw compressors from the company Bitzer. So Oxner has several case studies for high temperature heat pumps. Um, I got them from uh, Mr. Karl Oxner, the owner of the company. I just wanted to share it, these with you. Um, so 120 degrees, 90 degrees. So a few ones are uh, above 100 degrees. The capacity is in the several uh, hundreds kilowatts. Here um, it's a local district heating uh, network, which is 120 degrees. And then also hot water uh, production in a leather production uh, company in Portugal. And then some other uh, applications in heating and cooling, uh, process heat recovery and so on. The screw compressor uh, is there uh, together with the HFC refrigerant, but also with the uh, hydrochloroine fluorolefin. Uh, Bitzer is a screw compressor manufacturer in Germany and they have um, a developing line which was just recently presented also in, uh, in Chilventa or European heat pumps uh, unit summit. And um, so they have a standard uh, product which is at 70 degrees maximum uh, high temperature and then they could extend this product to higher temperature and other fluids you see them here and they are now uh, I think available uh, so the, they sell it uh, and then they have some uh, some products in the developing um, pro, um, how do you say it? Uh, a roadmap yeah um, so in the mid medium term and long term they will have some products which also reach higher temperatures. And this is a good sign because then the heat pump uh, designers can integrate this kind of compressors in, in their heat pumps. Um, here is already a prototype from, from the one which can work up to 125 degrees condensing temperature which has a capacity up to 410 kilowatts and it was just recently presented um, in European heat pump summit. There was also a presentation from the company Dorin from Italy which uh, are compressor manufacturers and they presented uh, a compressor line for butane 
which is a hydrocarbon and it is uh, very suitable for high temperature heat pump applications up to 160 degrees. So there are <coughs> compressor manufacturers uh, out there which um, develop new compressors to fit this uh, high temperature heat pump market. In Japan, uh, there are also products and I would say Japan is a, a pioneering country in the topic of heat pumps. Um, so the companies Mayekawa, Kobelco, as I mentioned before, and Mitsubishi uh, and uh, Fuji Electric have products. And you see they are on the market more than 10 years now but they typically do not export to other countries than Japan. So that would be uh, a step forward. They produce uh, heat uh, in the form of uh, water or steam. And uh, you see here the characteristics. Some are in transcritical cycles, so like CO2, um, or then subcritical, or this one with the steam uh, compression in, in a combined cycle. One interesting application uh, study which we were able to visit actually uh, when we visited Japan in the Annex 48 um, project was distillation of bioethanol at the Hokkaido et, uh, company and this is a distillation uh, process so the <coughs> distillate cooler uh, would be used or is used as the heat source uh, for the heat pump at 65 degrees has 10 Kelvin uh, glide and then it goes into the heat pump and produces low pressure steam 110 to 120 degrees and this way they can split um, the steam supply uh, more 70% uh, to the heat pump and before it was 100% by a oil fired boiler. So they can save a substantial amount of oil and reduce the CO2 emissions and uh, also reduce energy costs. What they have is um, a system of heat pumps in parallel, um, I think five units or four, yeah, five units uh, to increase the heating capacity. Um, when we put these two heat pump operating maps from Kobelco and Oxner into this uh, heat pump classification diagram, we see that they are here located in, in this, let's say, called very high temperature heat pump area. Um, we focus, as I said, on compression, vapor compression heat pumps, which are closed systems or also open systems with, many, me, with mechanical vapor recompression. In this presentation here, I do not uh, cover this uh, field. I think uh, there will be another presentation in more in this direction, but it is a very important application for industry vapor recompression. So steam generating heat pumps is a very interesting field and I think it has much more applications than we expect. So industry needs steam in many, many processes. And if we are able to produce steam uh, with high efficiency, with very low CO2 emissions, that will be very important to decarbonize industry. So this is a graph of the publications. So they are increasing over time, but there is a lack of steam compressors especially for use in heat pump cycles. So what is an efficient cycle uh, for a heat pump uh, to produce steam? The, the first, you can, we can illustrate that in the pressure enthalpy diagram from, of water. So at the beginning we have water of, of one atmosphere or one bar, and we want to reach this side here on the, on the right, the steam. One way is to increase the pressure and then uh, evaporate at this system. We have uh, maybe a preheating, then a pump, a vessel, which is gas fire boiler or electrical heating or even a heat pump to produce the steam. 
Another option is to decrease the pressure to a lower uh, pressure than atmosphere, evaporate and then recompress it uh, by several stages. This is more efficient. So it's the water here with an expansion valve to decrease the pressure, goes into a boil, a festal. Then we have uh, maybe a heat pump here or a waste heat, which is at the, in a high enough temperature to evaporate the water, which is here sub-atmospheric. Then we have low pressure steam here, 0.3, and then recompress it by three stages. We need a little bit water for intercooling and then steam. So this is a very efficient system. And when we look at the energy um, savings, the CO2 emissions reduction and the operating costs, we, we can compare uh, these kind of cycles or systems. Um, for example, here is a natural gas fired boiler for, for US or Switzerland here in this case. And here uh, at the bottom, it's this uh, shown system with vapor recompression. You can see that the energy consumption uh, is reduced by a factor of four and the CO2 emissions by a factor of 20. So quite um, substantial factors. Um, Kobelko, which is, um, was mentioned before, is using such a kind of system. So they have a, a closed cycle heat pump uh, with a screw compressor uh, here. Then the water is in the open loop with a soup cooler. Then another uh, con uh, heat exchanger producing steam goes in a flash tank. Saturated steam is recompressed to higher pressure steam. Um, another system is Mitsubishi Power. It has a closed cycle heat pump with um, isobutane. Uh, it's much larger um, capacity actually in megawatt scale. They have also then the compression here and it open loop water uh, recompression, water injection uh, control. So we looked at uh, some research of steam generating heat pumps. This is a table of different studies and just summarized and you see the activity is uh, worldwide, uh, many countries, uh, Korea, Japan, China, Netherlands, Norway, um, France and Canada. And you have the heating capacity. These are in lab scale or demonstration scale, the heat sources and the steam temperature. They are all above uh, 100 uh, degrees and the cycles um, are shown here and the compressor types and the refrigerants which are used and uh, some data of COP. Um, I don't want to go into more detail, um, just um, uh, remember the COP data, or not remember, uh, I just put it in another graph actually, and uh, as a function of the temperature lift, or then we can also recognize this uh, trend for the COP and an average COP is around 3.2 at 62 Kelvin lift. Uh, when you speak about steam generating heat pumps, uh, there are some suppliers. Uh, one is uh, SPH Sustainable Process Heat uh, from Germany. They have this system here, uh, 400 to 1000 kilowatt based on one uh, compressor, can run with water, steam or steam type up to six bar and the refrigerants used are uh, the hydrofluorolefins uh, depending on the, on the required um, steam pressure or, or temperature. And there are options for future uh, fluids. Uh, so th this system would be available. Then Heaton was mentioned before, it's the uh, former, uh, the, has bought the bankruptcy estate from Viking heat ex engines and they propose a, a one megawatt heat booster uh, with pilot end of 2022 and then a six megawatt heat booster. Uh, here is a sketch how this can look like or how it will look like. It's also providing uh, steam up to 165 degrees. Then I wanted to mention three European Horizon 2020 projects 
where the heat booster piston compressor technology has been or is demonstrated. So in dry efficiency, it has been uh, demonstrated as Ve Veronica ex uh, showed you very nicely, um, producing hot water um, for a drying uh, process for br bricks drying. Then another project, bamboo, uh, also generating steam. Um, it's a European project uh, with a company in Spain, uh, ArcelorMittal. Then Chester project is looking at uh, storage, uh, so um, high temperature storage, and there is uh, a heat pump with this fluid uh, to generate um, high temperature uh, heat. Another company I'd like to mention, which uh, some people typically have, uh, some forget maybe, is, uh, our, uh, is this company, Olvondo. They have the high lift um, uh, heat pump. It's running with a sterling uh, cycle, uh, not with a uh, uh, ranking cycle with uh, evaporation and condensation. No, this one is all in the gas phase with helium and they have um, um, this kind of cycle here on the top right. You have, we have, they have a four cylinder double acting Stirling engine. So there is the, the cold side and the hot side. And with this uh, principle or with this machine engine, they can achieve very high temperatures and also large glides. Uh, so temperature differences on the heat source and sink. One uh, case study of this high lift heat pump is in, in AstraZeneca uh, in Sweden and uh, they produce here steam at 175 uh, degrees from waste heat uh, of 35 degrees. The COP reached is 1.7 and they have three of such units installed in parallel so they can increase the heat supply capacity to 1.5 megawatt because each is around 500 kilowatt. So I'd like to mention the Annex 58 uh, project, which is on high temperature heat pumps from IEA HPT. And the objective is to provide an overview of the technologies up uh, higher than 100 degrees. And so we are there collecting leaflets and this was information from Benjamin Zülsdorf just recently in, uh, in the European Heat Pump Summit that there are now 20 leaflets of technologies uh, there, 30 will be expected, very nicely illustrating the technologies and for the demonstration and also leaflets of realized installations are collected. So this will be published next year. More information here on the website. So we'll, you will get, the, I think, the presentation later on and also it will be on the website. Um, last but at least I would like to mention some cycles or technologies for t heat pumps uh, with large temperature glides. So this is for uh, processes where the heat sink temperature difference, inlet and outlet, the glide is, is large. Uh, not like in steam generation where it is almost constant, so water evaporation. Uh, so in this case with large glides, there are several technologies. One is a subcritical cycle with a subcooler. Another is the two-stage extraction cycle. This is also with two heat exchangers, one in the, in the intermediate uh, pressure level. So it is also split into two heat exchangers, this heating up process. Another option is two parallel subcritical cycles. So like two machines in parallel and uh, the, they are connected then on the heat sink side. Reverse Brighton cycle is, is a cycle used, for example, from ECOP from Austria uh, in the rotational heat pump. They are very suited, suitable to fit the temperature glide to the heat demand. Uh, so the exergy losses are very minimized. 
Then we have here four others, transcritical CO2 cycles. So CO2 <coughs> um, has this kind of uh, thermodynamics. <laughs> Let's say you have a critical point of 31 degrees. So the source has to be lower than that. And then it is very useful to heat up water the, to 90 degrees, for example, or to make hot water. Or Then we have trans, other transcritical cycles with hydrocarbons or hydrofluorolefins, so with other uh, synthetic uh, working fluids. There are several options to reach even 200 degrees or, or higher. Um, then hybrid heat pump with ammonia water system uh, using absorption and desorption. So the ammonia is in a gas form and compressed to the higher pressure and the water will be pumped up to the higher pressure. Then they join again and absorb each other, let's say, and give uh, the, the heat, release the heat to the, to the process. Then there are refrigerant mixtures, which is a technology to fit um, exactly the heat demand. So these are systems or technologies, cycles to produce hot water or air. Um, the transcritical CO2 cycle is shown here a little bit more in detail. Uh, important is that the heat source needs to be lower than 30 degrees and the heat sink outlet could be in this range, so around 80 to 130, 120 degrees and then using maybe two gas coolers in this uh, section. So it's useful to for processes which have uh, which are um, which have simultaneous cooling and heating. On the right here we have butane as an example in the transcritical uh, cycle, and then we see that the source temperature or the, can be very flexible. So waste heat from industry could be used here uh, as a source, and then uh, temperatures. 150 to 200 degrees are, are reached uh, with butane. So it could be a, a useful fluid for such kind of um, temperature conditions. And there are other fluids um, for transcritical um, which could be useful. So I'd like to summarize. Uh, so it was quite a lot. <laughs> uh, but uh, so the market attractiveness is a very depending on the price ratio from electricity to gas. We, we have seen several application case studies and there are several demonstration projects and I'm sure many more than just showed here. Um, there are many products already on the market so we could use them in industry. So it's now uh, about the techno-economic studies um, for implementation and it needs engineers to, uh, to, uh, to do that integration work. So then we have seen steam generating heat pumps which are already on, available on the market but some on the develop, in the developing phase. We also see some COP values uh, that um, could be reached. Um, then there are several technologies for heat pumps and different cycles, uh, especially ones for large temperature glides and cycles for steam generation, which are efficient, and also cycles for large heat pumps. So it's really depending what heat pump for what application and so on, and what design is the most suitable one. So the integration is uh, yeah, varying from case to case. And we see a lot of research activity worldwide. And the uh, last point is the, the refrigerants. So there's a trend to natural refrigerants um, like butane, pentane, uh, CO2, water, but also synthetic fluids which have very low uh, global warming potential. Last but not least, some literature references from our research group and uh, 
yeah, we, you get this presentation later where we have the links already there to the direct uh, paper. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Swiss uh, Federal Office for Energy, which is uh, supporting our uh, research. I would like to mention also the project SWEET, Decarb CH, so decarbonization uh, of cooling and heating in Switzerland, which is a, a large project where we also are participating. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Corden, thank you so much. I feel like we've just had an update of the heat pump technology Bible. Uh, so much has changed from last year and that is just a wonderful uh, up update. Thank you so much. Uh, some observations there. Australia, well, you know, we are not on that chart there for R&D. And, and from what we see, we do have uh, companies like Blasium uh, uh, pushing things with CO2 and we've got JCI and Mayakawa out here pushing the temperature limits as well. But in terms of this really high temperature stuff, wow, we've got a lot to do and we've, we really need to get started. So uh, uh, we'll be looking for organisations like Race for 2030, the Cooperative Research Centre out here to help and drive uh, some of that innovation, I'm sure. Um, Look, I've got lots of questions, Corden, but we might see if we can, at the very end, we might try and get to those so we can do the, the bulk of the presentations on time. Corden, if you'd be able to maybe type in a couple of uh, questions there to some of those, uh, uh, sorry, a couple of answers, sorry, to the uh, questions uh, being put in the in the, in the Q&A box, that'd be great. Um, I would like to keep moving so that we've got uh, time for Oli Sipinen. Um, Oli, if you could uh, uh, start sharing your screen, sharing your presentation, I want to make sure we get through that for you. Um, I'd like to welcome Oli Sipinen from Howden. Uh, Oli is a sales director who has experienced and worked right across the world. Uh, so has a very big broad experience of understanding me mechanical equipment and different markets and where it's at, where this uh, equi mechanical equipment is applied. Uh, Ollie, you just saw that uh, MVR has mentioned many times and the need to, to compress steam, say, from, from coming from a, from a heat pump um, to, to make it more useful. Um, so your, this presentation is absolutely perfect and timely and I'll hand over to you, Ollie. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jared. So um, I hope you can see my screen now. So, okay. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, Ollie Sipinen. I'm a sales director in 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 Howden. I'm responsible of this uh, our uh, turbofans product line, global sales. And uh, uh, I will give you a short presentation about uh, a few, just a few words about the company, and then a little bit about the MVR process, and then our products what we can offer offer to this this application. And then I have a few examples and animation there and then a closing closing slides there uh, so if we start from from the howden so we are very old company so founded there in uh, 1850s there and uh, we we are making fans and compressors and uh, other uh, 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 gas heaters and and other equipments we are over 5,000 people in globally, where it, I think over 100 is working in uh, in Australia, and uh, and the turnover wise, we are 1.4 billion US dollars. So then I have just a few definitions there, which which you will see there uh, through through my presentation and also in in, uh, in these pre previous ones there to to just to talk about the uh mvc is is there the when we are lifting up uh, uh steam pressures to some some target pressure there and then uh, continue in further in process and then we talk about the mvr which is then a recompression so we are circulating the same steam in uh, in in the system and then uh, we have a vapor compressors to do the uh, do the pressurize and, and temp temperature lift and there underneath of this compressor there are different technologies uh, how to how to make it uh, happen so if you talk about the the MVR so so that I have categorized this to the evaporation and crystallization applications then we have this but we have talked about this 
steam recovery or heat, heat pump type of uh, applications. So uh, MVR is used um, in, uh, in applications there. Uh, and you need basically, you need to separate something solid and liquid. We are using uh, evaporation process and, and uh, that type of applications, the, the concentration rates are, let's say, quite low, low there. And uh, MVR is, is a good technology to be used there. So uh, taking up the, some uh, traditional example is, is the milk powder pro production there, when you want to separate the uh, moisture out from the milk, and which is then more easy to uh, transport and store as, as a powder. So there, if we go to the typical Sarastrix for the for the turbofans or compressors there. So we are talking about quite a, let's say low delta T there in in a range of, of five to to nine nine degrees, and and uh, usually the evaporators are usually in in a, in a, in a vacuum application. So the temperatures are there from somewhere from the fifteen to two hundred degrees the range there, and uh, then if we go to the uh, crystallization uh, side, so then the, the product concentrations are, are higher, thus the boiling point is, is, is a higher, higher there, so we need the more performance or more delta T from the, from the compressor side. So then the delta T uh, variates there from 15 to 20, 25 or even more, depending on, on, a, on a case. Uh, those are vacuum or overpressure applications so the temperature ranges are there approximately starting from the 80 to 250 50 degrees and uh, then we have this uh, more close of these today's topics is this that how to recover the, the uh, steam pressure there for the usable pressure pressure there and uh, this kind of a heat pump type application so there, the delta T's can be very, very high, which is required there, as, as we, can, we have seen. So, uh, depending on, on the site, uh, site design, three, three bar, six bar, eight bar, we have seen e even higher, higher requirements there. And uh, thus, the, the, the temperature range to where to work is, is starting from really low vacuum and could be then for the, uh, what, what pressure is then they need it to, to really high. Uh, then if if I go more to the, uh, uh, let's see if I get this. This uh, MVR process it, itself there. So this is the typical example of, of the evaporator there. So we have a calendria, uh, then uh, Proper separator and then, then the compressor. So in, in this type of uh, calendrias, uh, these are full of small tubes there where the product feed is then fed in uh, what, whatever is, is there made in a, in, in a site. And then we will get the live steam in, into the system and uh, we'll heat up this up to operational temperature there. And then instead of uh, pushing there the new steam, we are circulating the steam inside of this system. And uh, we are using a compressor there to, to lift up the pressure and temperature, which can, can be then fed back to the evaporator. So all, all the energy required for the, for the process is then, then taken from the electrical network instead of uh, producing a steam. Uh, and then if, if we look then the uh, sizing of this kind of a evaporation system, so the compressor power intake is quite a linear uh, in a function of the required uh, pressurize or delta T there. So if we have a high delta T there, so we are taking a more electrical power but we can reduce the, the size of the heat exchanger. So these are the kind of a parameters which are then 
template there that uh, what is the electricity price there and uh, what is the capital investment of, of this kind of a system there. So if we are evaporating some exotic things, so this calendars or heat exchangers could be, for example, titanium, when this is a very expensive component and then the higher delta T could be needed or or, or vice versa, if you have some seasonal product there, when uh, uh, when you want to have a low capex and then the higher opex is is accepted. So so there are different parameters than what the process EPC is, and and uh, our clients are are playing when they're selecting the evaporation system. So if if we go then to the economic side there so that looking up looking the the mvr process itself so this slide uh, demonstrates that uh, how much primary energy is required uh, to compare to to when when evaporate the one ton of water so so we can see that uh, there's a very big difference there if we can compare for example oil or coal and then instead of the MVR process. And uh, assuming that we are using a renewable energy source there, so we are, say, almost in a zero emission type of production there. And from, from the process side, so there could be some additional benefits what the customer, customers are gaining when using a uh, M MVR like a, like a smoother process control or water saving there, or or even if if the production is is made in in a sustainable way, so the the end product value could be the higher, so the customers are ready to to buy a more premium for the product. So we also have talked about in this previous presentation the COP value there, so so there are, it could be estimated uh, rather simple formula there but uh, like shown in in the previous slide then the the power estimate is is always then on, on a site specific because it a li little bit depends on the what is actually needed from the process and then uh, multiple other parameters there there so to get it in a, in a actual actual figure but it it could be a really attractive figures there to be seen So then if I go this exciting part there, so the how Howden is, is then supporting this um, MVR, MVR process. So we, we have a full product lineup to, to, to offer to our, our customers. So if we start from, this is the volume flow range here, and then we have a pressurized or delta T there in the Y axis. So in, in a very low volume flow end, we have a rotary type machines or we have a new product coming there for the centrifugal uh, small size tur turbofan. Uh, also we have a screw compressors there for the low volume and high high pressurized uh, applications and then we have a pure compressors so let's say medium flow and uh, high pressurized range and then uh, most of the applications we are cater with uh, with turbofan technology, so uh, which we can uh, start from quite low flow and go very high flows, and then combine the machines in series to get uh, even higher higher pressurized there in uh, when having having a serial connected machines there. And uh, in 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 MVR process, there are lo lot of then um, this this chart is is only that basic performance envelope there but there are a lot of uh, other parameters tend to be then discussed like uh, uh, what kind of a, is there carry over there in the process or what what is the operation rate ranges in inlet conditions temperatures pressure designs and uh, how corrosive what kind of materials to be used and, and so on so that we can uh, select correct product to to fit there uh in, in in the application then i i have a few examples here 
from from the different industries just to show that where the where the MVI is, is used. So the the dairy side we already mentioned about the milk or different uh, cheese production on concentrates is uh, uh, sugar crystallization uh, applications there or food and beverage industry there are a lot of uh, uh, products there to require some uh, the, the MVRs uh, like a tea or tobacco extractions uh, if we go to pulp and paper industry so we have a uh, black black liquor pre evaporators there or different further treatment applications or uh, ash crystallization uh, things or mechanical mechanical pulping uh, projects uh, chemical side uh, maybe maybe to uh, to mention for example different battery materials are nowadays uh, quite quite a booming industry so there are lithium or other other uh, battery materials required so which which uh, drives the requirement for the crystallization and, and uh, evaporation oil and gas and then uh, again some water treatment things or distillation and uh, and uh, pharmaceutical units like this this type of things so just a few few examples there from the past past deliveries so if if i then do the jump to the uh, summary of my presentation is that uh, the the mvr process and and uh, can can be play a good big role there to reduce the industrial uh, energy consumption and and the co2 emissions there uh, we also see there the, the trend there that uh, this uh, decarbonization and uh, electrifying the, the industrial processes is, is getting more and more important there and uh, from, from our side so we, we have uh, worked in, in uh, MV applications since uh, 19, 1980 so 1981 is, is the first installation there uh, we, we as a company we have a lot of different uh, product technologies to, to offer our, our customers and uh, then when we have worked for a long time there there are a lo lot of installations there also in uh, in operations so that's i think i have used my my time slot there so that's that's just shortly spot on i wanted to say. Oh, so thank you. you. Thank yeah. you for the attention. Many thanks, Ollie. That was a great overview of the technology and, and where that can be applied. That was that was really what we needed. Thank you. And uh, I certainly note there's a lot of MVR installations across Australia already uh, when it comes to black liquor evaporation, wastewater, uh, milk. There's plenty there. And also um, Illumina, there's a demonstration project happening with Alcoa in Western Australia, funded uh, partly by Arena. Uh, so certainly a, a lot, lot happening in this place. In, in this space, Ollie. That's that's true. That's true. So I think we have uh, over a hundred installations there in Australia, New Zealand, Zealand area, and uh, and uh, there are in interesting opportunities there. What we are discussing there, there in in Australia. Fantastic. Thank you so much there. And uh, I'll just uh, before we uh, we close out today, uh, I'd just like to to thank our speakers and sorry to everyone we're a little bit uh, over time here. Um, just like to thank our speakers and and, and to sort of reflect on a, on a few of the issues that came up there today, and 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 we certainly saw that. I think the key message is the technology is available. We've got uh, cheap renewable electricity in Australia and the prices are, are continue to come down and, and likely to further come down with further investment from the government and the commitments and what have you there. Um, and I'll, I'll take uh, Corden's words there. It's uh, really coming down to for engineers to, um, uh, to do the integration work now. And uh, so thank you to very much to our three speakers. Getting up early, 
and dialing in, uh, um, you all were completely fresh and sharp. It was great for this time early in the morning. You've come in from Europe. So thank you so much for, uh, uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, a wonderful update for us and uh, really going to help our whole community move on with understanding of, of, of where to, the, to, to use them. So thank you. Um, and now just to where that was the completion of our second uh, heat pump webinar for the month. We've got two more. Uh, th th we've got a webinar next Wednesday with a focus on meat processing and uh, Ollie will be looking at using MBRs for steam recompression and, and cordon. A lot of the meat uh, processing needs uh, for cooking of uh, rendering products is at high temperature. So the, the, what was presented today is absolutely uh, fantastic and just what we need. In two weeks time uh, uh, we've got a present uh, webinar on uh, for beverages and uh, these are actually closed webinars. We really want to have uh, an industry specific but uh, if you're a member of A2EP or or you have a special connection to these industries, please uh, drop us a line and we'll, uh, we'll try to include you in, in the audience uh, for that as well. Um, but uh, all that's left to say then once again is uh, thank you everybody for, for joining us today. I hope you, uh, you enjoyed it. If you want more A2EP, uh, follow us on LinkedIn where you'll see announcements about our upcoming webinars and what have you. Uh, but thanks again for joining us and thanks to our speakers and uh, enjoy the rest of your day in Europe and enjoy your evening in Australia. Thank you. <laughs>